Um, so I want to talk to you today about internal digital transformation. And this is about leveraging your existing technology, the existing technology platforms that you have within your enterprises for optimizing your business efficiency and using that to leverage and create initiatives for digital transformation which you can also gain for competitive advantage. Um, anyone from Estonia here? No one? Anyone been to Estonia? No? Right? So Estonia, so this was an article that appeared in BBC uh, uh, a few weeks ago actually. So Estonia in 1997, they made a decision to go digital, completely digital. So this means basically getting all of their government departments, uh, dig digitizing all of their government departments, making sure they're all connected so that the people in the country can have a digital experience in everything they do. So basically anything you want to get your, uh, pay your taxes, you want to pay bills, you want to get your prescriptions for your medicines or drugs. Um, if you want to, or even someone who wants to get citizenship within Estonia, it's all an online process now. It's fully digitized, you can have a mobile experience, which means you basically eliminate all the queues and the, the weeks of, uh, days and weeks of filling in forms and going through the whole process. Right? So effectively what they've done is digitizing the internal process, so if you take Estonia as a country, it's obviously not an enterprise, but it's a governmental organization, and internally within their country, they've made sure that they've integrated all these systems to a digital platform, so to provide the best experience for people, and basically giving back those hours and weeks and minutes of people's lives from what they were standing in queues for. So, when we talk about digital transformation, it is always, I mean, throughout this conference, throughout any other digital transformation conference that you go into, any article you read, it's a lot about the digital transformation that we do for competitive advantage. It's a lot about external, it's about a lot about uh, facing the external pressures and the, the market environment and the need to become more competitive and provide those awesome digital experiences to your users and customers. But at the same time, so this is a quote from Jack Welch, who was a former CEO at GE. So what he says is, if the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate of change in the inside, the end is near. Basically meaning that any changes that you are doing, or the transformation that you want to do externally, needs to be complemented by the changes that you are going to do internally as well. Because basically your processes, your business processes internally, need to be optimized. You need to make sure that your business activities and time to market is optimized for efficiency. Are you able to, to meet the demands of a digital experience for your external customers? If you're going to be giving them new touch points and you are expecting new, uh, uh, net new number of customers coming on board. You may have had 10 customers two years ago and you're probably going to have 100 customers now. Are you going to be able to deliver the same level of experience and uh, uh, that your customers are going to need? Is your internal efficiency around your billing cycles, your invoicing, your all activities that you do internally, right? In terms of managing the customers, your CRM capabilities, is it all optimized to manage that external demand now and the, the increased demand? How well do you know your customers, the customers uh, and, and the customer behaviors? Where is that data being stored and how easily is that data accessible? And do your employees have access to the data? Obviously within reason. Uh, and do they have the tools and the capabilities to look at that data, slice and dice that data, and be creative around that data so that they can contribute optimally in terms of coming up with you know, creative products, coming up with uh, uh, predictive marketing campaigns. Um, and last of all, are your costs optimized? Right? So if you are going in with a complete digital transformation strategy for your company, and obviously there's going to be a lot more initiatives happening, a lot more touch points with your customers, a lot more uh, interaction and, uh, with your customers, but which will probably real, uh, uh, result in your top line growth. But how is it going to affect your gross margins and your EBITDA? If that's going to have a decline, then obviously there's something wrong in your internal operation, which means which needs optimization. And a lot of our internal operations today 
uh, underpinned by a certain level of technology, right? So if we take some of the, the companies, over the years, we kept on putting in new systems in place. We probably have some aged old applications sitting on PCs or laptops. You will have some enterprise applications sitting on premise. You will have some applications on the cloud now, uh, which are, are more recent. Um, but the, the point though is, over the years, you collected a plethora of applications now, which are going to be largely disconnected. And because as and when you start adding these over the over a number of years, you don't put in a lot of thought about how these all these systems are going to work together. And when these systems are disconnected, basically what that means is there's going to be some level of manual uh, interaction with the systems where you'll need to take output from one system, go and plug it into another system, probably manually, and so on and so forth, right? And which means it's basically it's going to be a time-consuming faucet. It, it, it affects our internal the efficiency. It is, if as soon as there's human intervention, there's a possibility of human error, and obviously there'll be a lot of rework. And with all this, with all the people involved in the whole process, then obviously they'll start having the blame game. They'll have people you know, becoming frustrated with the system, there'll be disgruntled employees, and it affects the whole motivation around that. So what do you know? So, so you need to obviously fix this, right? So it's about what are your options now, going about creating that digital transformation within your company to overcome these issues and you know, create the, 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 the efficiencies that you need for your overall business operation. So first thing, obviously, if you have a few million pounds or dollars to spare, you can obviously go and get a nice flashy ERP type of system. Um, obviously, it'll be a huge cost in terms of implementation, licensing, maintenance, and with that cost, what will come in is a lock-in. Once you spend all those millions of pounds, um, you're not going to switch into something else anytime soon. And I can almost guarantee that any such system that you're going to put in place is going to need some level of customization anyway. Because of the, there's always going to be something unique about how your enterprise runs. And how, so then the, you will need, you're looking at either customizing your system or changing the way you work. Option two is to put in a lot more effort and, and also spend more money in terms of coming up with your own bespoke application, which again is going to take some time. But I mean, if you have the time and if you have the effort and the, 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 the skills internally, then that's the option to consider. But again, it's, it's going to cost quite a bit. And then the third option, which is what I want to talk about today, is basically transforming your existing technology. Why not just use the technology you have without going in for looking for new options and spending so much of uh, uh, funds uh, in terms of converting that. So what we are looking at basically is getting all your existing IT, your technology, talking to each other, looking for that glue that will uh, combine all of these systems so that you can uh, get into a position where you can, the systems will start talking to each other, you can correlate information across these systems and use that information to create data assets that you can also expose as APIs, which you can use, which your internal users can consume, and which you can also have your uh, expose externally for, for competitive advantage and creating competitive apps around that. So with that, you basically you start using your existing legacy systems. You don't need to optimize, you are kind of optimize on spend without having to spend on you know, new flashy systems that you need to get. And with the, as soon as you start connecting all these systems together, you enable automation. You get rid of the manual effort that's required to, to, to go about this. As soon as you can automate and get the information flowing and orchestrate that information, you can obviously optimize your business process. It'll be faster, it'll be less error prone. And basically, and you get a set of data that you can correlate. As soon as you have data that you can correlate across, across different systems, you start generating new insights and new information that you, were not, you didn't have access to before. For example, correlating information from your CRM system to accounting system, which you probably have, have, would have had to do manually through spreadsheets, etc. As soon as you can correlate this and push it onto a dashboard now, you will have real-time information and insights in terms of how how we are performing against your customers and the spend uh, from an from accounting perspective. So this is how we do it. So at WSO2, so in my role as Chief Operating Officer, it's all about optimizing how we work and 
or looking at where there's inefficiencies in our process and looking at what we can do in terms of increasing the, uh, uh, the, the efficiency around all these initiatives. So, and of course, when doing this, we will also always want to eat our own dog food. So this is the technology landscape at WSO2. So I'll run through a couple of examples in terms of what we've done internally. It's a, it's a journey. It's a journey which we've started about a year ago and it's still in the process. There's a lot of things that we want to do internally because as a, a company involved in digital transformation and advocating digital transformation to the world, we, there's a lot of things that we want to do internally as well before we start pushing the, in, uh, the external di digital transformation story. So this is this part of our uh, increasing technology landscape at WSO2. So we have Salesforce for, for our CRM. We have Jira for uh, incident management, Conquer for expenses, um, Jenkins for uh, our build, and NetSuite for uh, our financials, etc. And then there's a, there's a lot more that's, that's not even here. We also have a, a bunch of uh, internal applications that we built inside. So we need to make sure that we connect all these applications in some way to provide that internal efficiencies and operational efficiencies that we need for the internal digital transformation efforts that we want to go through. So a couple of examples in terms of what we've done, and I'm sure this is a use case that a lot of you uh, will face on a day-to-day -day basis. As soon as you have so many applications internally, What's going to happen is all of these systems by uh, natively will have their own username and password requirements. You will, and, and the formats will be different. It's very rarely that you're going to be able to use the same username and password in some way uh, to log into all these systems because the password will have different conventions. Some will say I want uh, uh, alphanumeric characters, some will want special characters, etc. So as soon as we have to do that, what, we, what you see is people start writing their usernames and passwords in notepads and put it under the drawers or keep it in a notepad in a document on your computer. Uh, and invariably people are going to forget passwords, um, and which means they are going to have delays in logging into systems and going through uh, the process of uh, activating what they need to do. Um, and it, it increases your support costs because obviously you need to have a support desk to help these people to get through the whole, uh, whole process of logging in before they even start doing their work. So at WSO2 what we've done now is we've implemented WSO2 Identity Server to, and, and uh, along with that single sign-on onto all these applications. So what I do when I come in is with my WSO2 Identity uh, or ID, uh, shavan at wso2.com, and a single password that I have, I log in, and I, at once I get access to all of these applications, which is all enabled through WSO2 Identity Server. So this is the st start of the journey on this. As a next step, what we want to do is also, in terms of provisioning, uh, when, a, when a new person joins our company, if you know that he is from the engineering team, we just go and tick a box somewhere, and in the, as part of the provisioning process, this person will get access to all the systems he needs to work on as an engineer. Right? It's probably going to be different for someone who joins the finance team. If we know that he's joining the finance team, with just one click, we will provision his access to all the systems he needs to be as a, in the finance team. And similarly, when he's leaving the company, we should be able to deprovision him as well from all the systems without going into each of the systems and deleting their accounts now. Um, so wh what you see here, there's an internal uh, set of applications. That's basically the applications that we use for our employees. There's a set of public-facing applications with what we have at WSO2. So this is basically as you as customers or partners, which you, what you log into uh, to interact with WSO2. So, but there is also a need for uh, people within WSO2 to be able to access the, the external-facing systems. So as part of our roadmap, we're also looking at implementing identity federation now, again, which is possible with identity, WSO2 identity server, so that with this single login, you will be able to log in to both internal and external sites. So this is basically the view that we have now uh, for any of our WSO2 uh, employees. They just need to log in using their WSO2 ID and they are logged in to what we call the app manager where all the applications, they, it's all now logged into. They just need to click on the application and they are in. So there's a lot of efficiencies that we gain through this process in terms of the, the, the basically starting or starting to work with our internal IT. So this was a... Uh, uh, I'll say was, because it's no longer how it is now. 
This was a very time-consuming business process that we have. So this is basically the process for allocating uh, consultants for any custom engagements. So when an account manager comes and tells us that they won a new deal or, or there's a consulting engagement that we need to resource, this account manager will go and put an entry in Salesforce as our CRM system. They had to go and fill in a Google form. The Google form will tell, uh, we will, will say who the customer is, where the location is, wh what dates the, the consultant is needed, what's the scope of the engagement, etc. When you save the Google form, it will generate an email that goes into allocation team. So we have a, a set of people who are dedicated to working on allocating people and you know, looking at the resource profiles, etc. So they will go through the resource profile, they will look at the email, they will manually copy that information into a Google spreadsheet. From the spreadsheet, then they will have allocation meeting. Through the allocation meeting, they will identify a consultant, they will send out an email to that consultant, again, by copying information that they got from these original forms. Once the consultant says they are ready to go and they can travel on this, we send, we go and update another spreadsheet for travel. And, and, and using that, there's a, another email notification that's sent out manually to the consultant and all those who are relevant to you know, calculate their per diems, et cetera, and finance to carry out that process. So this was largely inefficient. And what we noticed is at the end of that, the, we, due to all the copy and pasting that was happening, there was uh, instances where the address was wrong, the location where the person needs to go, and sometimes even the country. <laughs> you know, the country was wrong, and luckily, obviously, using common sense, we know that that's not where he's supposed to go. But, uh, but then there's other important information like the, the, the cost center. If you need to you know, book that cost into a particular team or a, a particular department within WSO2, all that is usually captured in Salesforce or in this Google form, but when due to this copy and paste and the, the manual editing of this, by the time it went to that last uh, uh, stage, sometimes what the finance team got was a different or a non-existent cost code. So what we did was basically thought we'll scrap this process. We used we started using our own dog food. So all the information we need for the custom allocation is there in Salesforce. All the information about our people is there in People HR, which is our, our HR system. We've developed a bunch of connectors which are capable of uh, integrating between our, between our enterprise service bus and these external applications, uh, Salesforce and People HR. So through this, we collect the data that we need, and we created a very really lightweight application called WSO2 al um, Allocations. Um, so that, what will, what this application, so this is where uh, account manager will now log in uh, and create that allocation record. When you create that allocation record, it will basically pull all the information from Salesforce through the connectors, and then when it, the, uh, it invokes kind of a workflow where the allocation team now can go and pick someone from people HR uh, through the integrations that are there, so that they will also know who's available and who has been on uh, um, such engagement before. Uh, they can do the allocation uh, within the system that will then have an integration into another system that we have called WSO2 Travel, another internal application that we created. It will automatically send a request or uh, create a record there. It will send all the notifications automatically. And this is the same information that was first there in Salesforce that is now orchestrated down through all these systems, down to all the emails that flow out. There is no manual work around this. And also what's most important is it creates a report. So. If you look at this, this final, so this is uh, some screenshots of this, uh, this allocation application that I spoke. The last screenshot there is basically a report that is used by the finance team now. So usually at the end of a month, what the finance team used to do was go into multiple spreadsheets uh, to identify what a person in the company was doing at each point. Was, was he in R&D? Was he on a custom engagement? Was he doing support? Was he in some pre-sale activity? Or was he doing some marketing activity? Because we need to take that cost and allocate it accordingly into the different cost centers. So his, his payroll is apportioned accordingly. But to do that, because he had to go through all these processes, it was, it was a two to three week effort at the time. Now it's cut down to two days. Because all of this, this particular report will tell, you give anyone any, any name, 
he'll tell you of a 30 day month that one person was there five days doing this engagement, three days in that, along with the cost center codes. They just need to download this, apply their payroll, and just upload it into NetSuite. So as a roadmap activity on this, what we also want to do now is have an integration from this particular view into NetSuite, so that payroll, uh, payroll calculation and allocation can also happen automatically. Uh, and basically reducing that the, the people in incentivity around that whole activity. So correlated dashboards. So this is, we are now spawning dashboards all the time. Uh, this is about connecting all the information we, we, we have through all the systems that we have, creating our own little big data store so that we can correlate information across these systems. So we basically have now started coming up with dashboards around our customer information, uh, our employees, our support tickets. Um, actually, I have some screenshots around these uh, systems. It's all fake numbers. These are from generated from test systems because of the sensitivity around this. Uh, we have information around the build, um, support, et cetera. So basically everything. So everything is now coming up into dashboards, but it's not just raw information coming out from one system. It is information. For example, this finance dashboard has information that is correlated now between Salesforce and NetSuite, which tells us from the, the bookings that we're making to the, uh, uh, the convergence between bookings coming right down to cash, which then needs interaction between um, Salesforce and uh, NetSuite. So it's a journey. It's a journey that uh, we've started, as I said, uh, about a year ago. Uh, and it has its own challenges of its own. Um, so but starting the journey was a realization that obviously the first thing is obviously you need a, a vision and a purpose to why you want to start transforming your internal digital IT. Right? And you saw, as you saw in the, the quote from Jack Welch, it's more about keeping up and being able to facilitate and support the, your external digital transformation activities. And, uh, um, and, and so it's basically coming up with the why. And once you come up with the why you want to do this internal digital transformation, it's very important to identify uh, internal digital transformation champion. And this digital transformation champion basically can be your CIO, can be a, a, your head of operations, or it just can be someone who has been around for a long time. It has to be someone who understands the business end to end, from everything you do, from engineering to delivery to uh, how your sales works, how marketing works, how finance, legal, etc. works. Because if you don't have that complete picture, you don't know how the, op how the whole process can be optimized. Because you need to know how information gets orchestrated across the different systems. So once you know that and once you've identified this person, then obviously you need to start looking at mapping out your internal business processes. Once you have that, then you can start looking at uh, where do I prioritize now? You'll identify so many places that you want to optimize, but where do I now prioritize? Um, and you, as you said, saw earlier, there are certain stuff that we prioritized earlier in terms of um, optimizing that allocation business flow, etc. There's a lot of other things that we have in the roadmap now. Uh, and once you've done that, you need to select the technology that you want to do for this internal digitization, and then just go for it. Um, technology considerations are very really important here. Because again, there will be so many systems that you have internally that, you, uh, that, that, that need to talk to each other. So which means you'll have systems that are you know, legacy systems, systems in the cloud, systems uh, on, on standalone. Um, how can your integration or the technology that you're going to use for this integration, how can that uh, enable this transformation if there is, and is, does it support, is it compatible with all the technology that you have now? Uh, it needs to support the different protocols that you have. If you have plans to go into the cloud, uh, how is it going to support your cloud use cases, etc. How easy is it to implement? Can you do it yourself? Is there, uh, are there partners around who can do it for you? Is it well documented? As these are very important uh, considerations in, in terms of um, selecting the technology. Support and maintenance, again, is extremely important because this you will be deploying in an enterprise scale. You can't have downtime. You can't have issues around it, you can't have bugs. So you need to have a, some kind of a support and maintenance agreement around the, the software, that the, the technology that you select, which is also backed by SLAs. And then finally, the total cost of ownership. Regardless of the technology that you use, uh, you need to always start looking at 
what is your three year or five year cost around this? Um, because it, it just doesn't come down to the licensing costs, you need to consider all the implementation, maintenance, etc. And then use that as a comparison when you're looking at the technology that you want to uh, leverage. And of course, there's always challenges. As soon as you say it's an internal initiative, it's always lesser priority. You can always do it tomorrow. And then I'm, I'm sure you face this uh, a lot as well. Because always it, it, the, the emphasis is a lot about focusing on customer demands, focusing on the, 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 the external environment, the market environment, etc. Right? So this is why you need a strong champion who will be able to justify the case and justify the why we need to go through this whole journey. And then as soon as you start starting the journey uh, and then coming up with your, the changes you want to do internally, you start facing uh, uh, issues in people resisting change. If, um, and you know, uh, statistics show that 85% of us don't like change at all. So again, this comes down to uh, very much to the, uh, the champion or the um, digital transformation champion to be able to persuade people to try it out. You know, don't do a big band approach in terms of changing systems overnight. Get people involved in the journey. Get people, uh, give them proof of concepts, give them uh, something to play around with and get involved in the whole journey so that when it comes to actually implementing and uh, rolling it out, it's nothing new to them. And they will obviously see the benefits. So ROI, again, it's something that's, again, when it comes to internal project, the way you, you measure your ROI and all that, it's, it's probably not very formal. So this is something you need to do in terms of measuring all the metrics very carefully and have systems in place so that you can measure everything you do. And as you, soon as you have all the measurements around that, then obviously you can use that to justify your case for new digital transformation projects and activities that you want to do. And of course the technology challenges, if you've done, gone through your technology selection properly, you will, this will be less of an issue, but obviously there'll be the day-to-day -day technology challenges in terms of how you go about integrating the technologies and uh, you know, going about the different issues that you come across. But then obviously if you have the support agreements, if you have a good team to back you up uh, on the technology, then that is not going to be uh, too much of a challenge. So um, internal digital, digital transformation is a lot about optimizing what you have internally, optimizing your systems so that you can be on par with the transformation that you want to do externally. And, as, and it's something that needs to really go hand in hand uh, to make sure that you keep, uh, the ch keep changing and you can support and facilitate all the demands that are required to be met by the, the transformation that you want to do in terms of uh, facing external competition. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you.